Great. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Canon Institute and to our discussion commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Leningrad hijackers case. I am Isabella Tabarovsky. We are delighted that you were able to join us today. Uh, as part of today's event, for those who pre-registered, we made available a link to the award-winning documentary about those events, courtesy its director, Anna Zalmanson Kuznetsov, who is with us today, called Operation Wedding. If you did not pre-register or could not view the film on our free link, you can view it later by going to operation-wedding-documentary.com, where you can view it for a small fee. And we will repeat this information at the end of the event. I also want to say that our event is co-sponsored today by NCSEJ, National Coalition Supporting Eurasian Jewry, and the Rabin Chair Forum at George Washington University. So our thanks go to Mark Levin of NCSEJ and to Walter Reich of the Rabin Chair Forum for providing the support and helping spread the word about today's event. And we are, of course, very grateful to have Anad Zalmanson Kuznetsov, Glenn Richter, Svi Gittelman and Jonathan Dekelhen with us today to discuss those events. Before we begin, let me also remind you that we can that uh, you can send your questions via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when sending the questions and it, it will uh, improve the chance that the question will be bumped to the top of the line. Let me start the discussion by introducing the film's director, Anad Zalmanson Kuznetsov. Anad was born and raised in Israel. She studied filmmaking in Israel and England before embarking on, a, on her successful film career. Her documentary, Operation Wedding, has appeared in film festivals around the world and has won awards for Best Documentary and Best Story. She has also produced a film of archival materials for historians of the struggle for Soviet Jewry. And this, these materials have served as a foundation for an educational online program called the Refusenik Project. Um, Anat is currently co-producing a feature film based on her father's book, Prison Diaries, and her documentary, Operation Wedding. Anat, please. Well, you know, um, I, was, I was lucky enough to be born free, to be born in Israel. And uh, I always appreciated the freedom because my parents had to risk their lives and freedom, of course, just to, for a simple basic human right to leave a country. Because the USSR, they didn't let anyone well, they did let a few people out, but they didn't let most people out. And to all, in order to get out, which is very basic for us, if we want to get out of the country, we just book a flight and we fly, right? But no, in the USSR, you have to apply for a visa. If you apply for a visa, you would probably be refused. When you are refused, you, uh, you are titled as a traitor. You probably lose your job. So you're stuck in a limbo. You are, and, and as a Jew, you are not welcome in the country because... Uh, anti-Semitism was very high in the Soviet Union, although, of course, um, the Soviet leaders would announce that everybody are equal, but this was uh, a lie, like uh, other lies that are uh, said by the Soviets. And so uh, my parents and their friends, after being completely um, desperate, not only to leave, but to go to Israel, the country where they would feel belong, where they're not foreigners, so they, they simply, they didn't even try to change the country, the USSR. It's not like a dissident. They just wanted to, to live a quiet life where they belong. And after being refused a few times, um, a person from the Zionist underground in Leningrad came to my mother, Silva Zalmanson, with an idea, with a suggestion. Would you agree to hijack a plane with us? And I'm saying hijack because it was an empty plane. It wasn't with people. And she said, of course. And so she, she was recently married to my father, Eduard Koznitso. She introduced him to, to the group. And very quickly, because my father is a natural leader, he became the leader of the group and he communicated with the pilot, especially after the, the, there was an original group of 50 people. They wanted to take a 64 seat plane. And so the, those 50 people, they decided to um, not to do the plan anymore because they were afraid that it will harm the, the Zionist underground. And so the group became the, a group of 16 people buying all the tickets to a 12-seat plane. And the pilot 
would take over the controllers and fly outside the Soviet border, which was basically 15 minutes. Of course, it's an hour flight, but 15 minutes for, to cross the border. So theoretically, it could have worked, but too many people knew about it, and of course the KGB knew about it. And looking at, looking, if I look back, if we look at it now, and now it's easy to look back and say everything and, and see how it should have been. If they would have succeeded, then they might have been free, but other Jews in the Soviet Union might have been, continued to be locked behind those walls. So in that sense, in the history sense, it may, might have been better that they were caught. And the KGB, the mistake was also that they wanted to catch them in the airport to show the world, look at those bullies who fight for Zionism, they hijack a plane. But what really happened was the world heard about it and they thought, wait a minute, why don't you let people out? And why are people so desperate to leave? And this trial uh, became, the, it, it kickstarted the whole Soviet jury movement, which already started, but then it became bigger. And, uh, and six months, and this was 50 years ago, exactly this week, 50 years ago, they were arrested. And six months after there was the trial, and the, it was the trial, the whole group, they did not ask for forgiveness. They said, we only wanted to get out. We only wanted to go to Israel. And, um, and they received very harsh punishment between eight to 15 years. And my father, Eduard Koznitsov, and the pilot, Mark Dimschitz, received death sentence. And that was their second mistake of the Soviets, because if they were them two or three years, maybe people in the world would have not reacted as they did. They, maybe they would have said, okay, it makes sense. They did some sort of crime. They deserve a punishment. But the punishment was so harsh. And once again, they did not hurt, they did not hurt anyone, and they didn't plan to hurt anyone. And this is a very important uh, issue because the whole world, well, most of it, Soviet Jewish movement was nonviolent one, and it achieved. It, it was successful as well. So this is a very important lesson from history. We can, we can, uh, we can understand from this story, which is inspiring. It's always inspiring for me. Uh, many times I feel like, what can I do? You know, who am I? Who am I? I have no power. But then I think, how dare I think like that? Because look at my parents' story and look at people like, uh, you know, the people who were fighting for them. They didn't think like that and they changed the world. Isabella, if you have a follow-up question, because I feel like I finished uh, talking. I'm not used to doing speeches. I'm used to answering questions. <laughs> this, this was excellent and uh, an excellent introduction to our discussion. I will definitely have follow-up questions. Uh, but for now, let's move to Glenn to hear him speak, because Glenn was on the other side of the Iron Curtain, fighting for your parents and others uh, with them from the United States. So Glenn Richter is a leading activist in the campaign for Soviet Jewry, one of the leading activists. In 1964, Glenn was among the founders of the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry, uh, which was the first grassroots American movement for the liberation of Jews from the USSR. Glenn was the national coordinator for the movement until 1991, until the very end of the Soviet Union. Starting with 1974, Glenn was also able to travel to the USSR to meet with refuseniks and often met in Israel with former refuseniks and prisoners of Zion or families of those still trapped in the USSR. Uh, Glenn is the author and editor of numerous booklets and news releases detailing the plight of Soviet Jews, uh, which were very important at the time to deliver information uh, from behind the Iron Curtain. And he has continued to be involved in archiving the work of the Soviet Jewry movement. Glenn, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Before I begin, a nod to Professor Tzvi Gittleman. 60 years ago, he was the head waiter and I a lowly waiter in a summer camp. Tzvi taught us waiters useful Russian phrases like kapitalista uvas dienge, and the words to happy birthday which we found out later were fake Russian. A couple of years ago in Jerusalem, I interviewed Dr. Rami Aronson, originally from Norway. Just before Passover 1970, he was sent by Israel's then secret Soviet jury office called the Lishka to visit Jews in Moscow and Leningrad. In Leningrad, he gained the trust of Hillel Butman, 
who with former pilot Mark Dimschitz came up with a plan. It was to fill an air flight passenger with many dozens of Jews desperate to emigrate to Israel under the guise that they were all going to a wedding. Then they'd hijack the aircraft for freedom. Since there was disagreement among the growing group of plotters whether to actually carry out the deed at a time of hijacking by Palestinian terrorists, the leaders wanted the advice of the Israeli government. So Rami and the plotters cooked up a cover story for a phone call from Israel back to the USSR, medical advice for a refused mixed mother. If the Israelis gave a go-ahead, the advice would be to take her out for fresh air. If not, then don't take the medicine. When Rami left Russia and spoke to Israelis, his Israeli handlers, they couldn't believe that there was such a strongly organized Jewish underground network. A call was made back to Leningrad, don't take the medicine. As you saw in Anat's film, a small group nevertheless persisted and were arrested on June 15, 1970. The KGB staged coordinated raids against Jews in four cities. Then was it now, with instant news and social media. The word first came only a week later when foreign correspondents perusing Leningradskaya Pravda in a Moscow library saw a back page item about the arrests. But for us in the Soviet Jewry movement, this little aircraft turned a prop plane into a turbocharged jet. In the early 1960s, leftist editor Moshe Dechter recruited civil rights and peace leaders to speak out for Soviet Jews. An independent local committee was formed in 1963 in Cleveland. Late that year, a group of us students, several involved in the civil rights movement, met in New York with Jacob Birnbaum. He was a British expat who grew up as a child in Nazi Germany. His father, in fact, had coined the term Zionism. Jacob was driven by an urge to redeem a quarter of world jury locked in the USSR. By late, 1964, 150, by late April 1964, 150 students met at Columbia University. We voted that in four days, May Day, we demonstrate for the rights of Jews at the Soviet UN mission. We organized like crazy. On May Day, over 800 Jewish students came out from the proverbial woodwork and marched for four hours in silence across the avenue from the Soviet UN mission. We said we were silent because Russian Jews were forced into silence. The New York Times ran a story and a photo on page two. But that's the last time we made the tactical error of silence. From that demonstration, a student movement grew, the student struggle for Soviet jury. We adopted the nonviolent philosophy of Martin Luther King. We put a unique Jewish twist on tactics, which drew from civil rights and anti-war movements. In the USSR, Jews were, as Elie Wiesel wrote, the Jews of silence, suffering mass discrimination and virulent government anti-Semitism. But they found their voices in the wake of the 1967 Six-Day War, when little Israel defeated surrounding Russian-supplied Arab armies. A few brave individual Jewish voices emerged from the Soviet darkness, then groups, all demanding their human right to go to the ancestral home Israel. Now our movement had heroes we could name. In the USSR, a Jewish underground slowly formed in the mid-60s, especially in the Baltics, where communism came only during World War II. In several cities, young Jews who knew little about religion gathered on Jewish holidays outside the few remaining synagogues just to be with each other. When the first trial of the Leningrad, quote, hijacked plotters began in December 1970, street demonstrations and rallies representing a spectrum of the Jewish community broke out in New York, D.C., San Francisco, where there were Soviet offices, and other cities, in Europe and in Israel. You saw in the film that Golda Meir successfully urged General Franco of Spain to commute the death sentences of Basque separatists to embarrass the Kremlin to commute the death sentences of, the two, of two of the Leningrad defendants. Bowing to the international uproar, some of the other sentences were reduced. The Soviet's intent in the Leningrad trial was to intimidate the Jews into silence. It backfired. Thousands of Jews began to apply to emigrate to Israel. The brave ones enlarged the Jewish underground, sent out appeals, and met with foreign visitors. Here in the US, we learned that the real leverage on the Kremlin came from Washington. We helped pioneer mass lobbying by high school and university students in the halls of Congress. We learned that it's nice for a member of Congress 
to insert support for Soviet Jews in the extension of remarks of the congressional record. But it took years of heavy lifting by students, our colleagues of the Union of Councils for Soviet Jews, and finally the Jewish establishment to help pass and maintain the seminal legisl legislative lever, the jackson vanik Amendment. It tied trade credits to communist countries to freer emigration. The Kremlin raised emigration rates when it thought it could kill the bill, then lowered emigration in fits of retaliation. We continue to demonstrate, even in Red Square, during the 1988 Reagan-Gorbachev summit, and to pour out information to the media, gained from contacts in the USSR, to disseminate documentation and brief hundreds of tourists to the USSR who were visiting refuseniks. Members of Congress and even Secretary of State Schultz met with, in Moscow with refusenik leaders. In December 1987, tens of thousands of us gathered in Washington on the eve of the Reagan-Gorbachev summit, and even Vice President Bush was among the speakers. On the dais were some of those 1970 plotters who never touched the aircraft, but who spent years in the gulag. It was on their figurative backs that over a million of our brethren ultimately took flight to freedom. The Soviet jury movement helped propel the American Jewish community from lower profile to assertive, from guilt for its relative silence during the Holocaust to openly demanding rights for its trapped brethren. Our students became leaders of the Jewish and general communities. In our early marches, we held up a huge painting entitled Redemption, and to some extent, we redeemed ourselves. Thank you very much, Glenn, uh, for this passionate presentation. And we are now going to move to Tzvi Gittelman, who, um, uh, who will give us a, historical, a historian's perspective on these events. And as a reminder, you can send your questions via email to kenan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kenan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when you send your questions. Tzvi Gittelman is Professor Emeritus of Political Science and Preston Tisch Professor Emeritus of Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. He has written or edited 17 books and many articles on Soviet, East European, and Israeli politics and on Russian and East European Jews. Most recently, The New Jewish Diaspora, Russian-Speaking Immigrants in Israel, the U.S., and Germany, which came out in 2016. Uh, Tzvi has been a visiting professor in Israel, Hungary, Russia, Ukraine, and a fellow at Harvard, Oxford, and many other places. He's active at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and at the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. Tzvi, please. Thanks very much. I'd like to give you a little bit of background to the dramatic story of the events that we've been discussing and that we've seen. The situation of Soviet Jewry since 1948 had become dismal. After that date, no Jewish institutions existed for nearly 3 million Jews. No schools, no newspapers, no theaters, no academic institutions. Synagogues were largely closed and rarely attended. Moreover, Jews were barred from hierarchies in the Soviet system, wherein they had once been quite prominent. Jews were not accepted into military academies. They were barred from government posts, high party positions, and so on. And many fields of endeavor became closed to Soviet Jews. This is why so many of them seem to have become engineers and technicians because these were non-ideological, non-sensitive areas. And so when you couldn't be a journalist, you couldn't be a lawyer, you couldn't work for the government, you turned to something that was ideologically not sensitive and where Jews more or less, depending on the place and time, could be accepted. The overall psychological situation of Soviet Jews was contradictory. On the one hand, they were forced to be acculturated. That means that they did not have a distinct culture of their own, which for many centuries they had. Uh, 
they had lost their language. All Yiddish schools, not to speak of Hebrew and religious schools, had been closed by Soviet authorities by the time the war had ended. They had no knowledge of their own history, their own culture, what had been the religion largely of their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. And they had become, by and large, Russian, socially and culturally. On the other hand, they could not assimilate. That is to say, they could not lose their Jewish identities because every citizen in the USSR since the early 1930s was identified officially by nationality. Jewishness was considered a nationality. And that nationality was inscribed on everyone's internal ID, or in the Soviet terminology, passport. I knew who you were by ethnicity, Russian, Ukrainian, Jewish, Uzbek, Tajik, so on. So officially, so as well, Jews were regarded as Jews. Culturally, they were not Jewish. How does one resolve such a tension? This was very difficult. And some Jews in the early 1960s began to think about the revival either of Judaism or of Yiddish secular culture in the Soviet Union. They took a cue from the ethnic and national demands of Ukrainians, Baltic people, Crimean Tatars, and even Russians, which had begun to emerge in the relatively relaxed regime of Khrushchev and his successors. A major turning point was in the 1967 Middle East War, where Soviet client states, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, who were explicitly pledged to destroy the state of Israel, the only Jewish state in the world, these Soviet client states attacked Israel, and the three million Jews of Israel at the time seemed to be facing the kind of annihilation that the six million Jews of Europe had experienced only 20, 25 years before. This was a major shock to Soviet Jews. How would you feel if your country was backing politically, militarily, logistically, countries which were pledged to destroy the state, which was largely Jewish, not exclusively so, and you were not a Zionist, you didn't intend to go there yourself, but how could you live in a country that was attacking people related to you by family ties, by history, and by culture? Moreover, Soviet anti-Zionist and anti-Israeli propaganda was massive, constant, ubiquitous. And the Soviets stooped to presenting caricatures in their media, which closely resembled the caricatures of Jews that had been presented to their audiences by the Nazis only several decades earlier. So people became alienated from the Soviet Union just as the Soviet Union had felt that Jews were somehow second-class citizens and alienated from the mainstream of Soviet society. The demand for emigration began to grow. And the Soviets had not permitted people to leave their country since the mid-1920s. They were completely unfamiliar with the dynamics of migration. They seemed to have calculated that if they let the leaders, the troublemakers of this peculiar dissident movement go, then the movement would die a natural death, they would be rid of troublemakers, and they would have solved a problem. Indeed, the first Jews to leave for Israel were those from the peripheries of the Soviet Union, not from its heartland. They were from the Baltic states in the West, they were from Georgia in the Caucasus, and it seemed to be a marginal movement. What the Soviets did not calculate was that migration feeds on itself, chain migration. When one person left, 
that person's relatives, coworkers, friends, neighbors would start thinking about leaving as well. And so the movement multiplied. But then the Soviets tried to shut the doors, even though after President Jimmy Carter of the United States had put human rights on the international agenda, where it had not been, and today it's very hard to think of a situation where the international community was not concerned with human rights, even though the Soviets had signed the so-called Helsinki Agreement of 1975, which guaranteed free immigration, emigration to all people. The Soviets experimented with migration, and by 1979, 51,000 Jews had left the Soviet Union, mostly to Israel. But with the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union, detente, the relaxation of tensions between the West and the East, came to an end. The United States boycotted the 1980 Moscow Olympics, and the Soviets reacted by turning off the free emigration of Christian evangelicals, ethnic Germans, Jews, and Armenians. So that by 1985, rather than 51,000 Jews leaving, only 914 from all over the Soviet Union were permitted to leave. The Soviet Jews who led this movement, who participated in this movement, were, as we've discussed and as Glenn mentioned, supported by people in the West, Western Europe, Israel, the United States, Canada. And the reason this issue became popular was not just its in its intrinsic human rights appeal, but I would say partly because of feelings of guilt on the part of world Jewry that they had not done enough to save the Jews from the massive annihilation that the Nazis conducted. Secondly, it was an appeal that could it was a cause, rather, that could appeal across the political spectrum. For political liberals, this was construed as a human rights movement. For political conservatives, it was construed as a blow against the evil empire, the USSR. There were two issues that had united American and other Jews for quite a while, support for Israel, and support for Soviet Jewry. As support for Israel began to fractionate, Soviet Jewry became the consensual issue for people outside the USSR. The result was that with Glasnost and Perestroika, which Mikhail Gorbachev introduced in the late 1980s, the doors of the USSR were finally opened. And to date, about 1.6 million Jews and their non-Jewish relatives have left the USSR and its successor states. About two thirds have gone to Israel and the rest between 300 and 500,000 to the United States and about 220,000, ironically in my view, to the Federal Republic of Germany. Soviet Jews constitute the largest single immigration to the state of Israel. This is one of those great ironies of Israel, of history, where the state which was committed against Zionism, even before that state was formed, as early as 1903, Lenin had criticized Zionism, not because he was anti-Semitic, quite the contrary, but because he saw it as a nationalist bourgeois movement. That state, with whom the USSR had unilaterally broken relations in 1967, became the recipient of more Jews from the USSR than from any other country. I would conclude by saying 
that in my mind, the Soviet Jewry movement and the Soviet Jews who moved constitute the second great victory of Jews, in addition to the creation of the State of Israel, in, of the 20th century. A century in which Jews suffered their greatest catastrophe in modern history. Svi, thank you very, very much. And let me now introduce our final panelist uh, for today, last but not least, is Jonathan Dekelhen. Professor Jonathan Dekelhen is the Rabbi Edward Sandro Chair in Soviet and East European Jewry at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he holds a dual appointment in the Department of Jewish History and Contemporary Jewry and in the Department of General History. He served from 2007 to 2019 as the academic chairman of the Leonid Nevzlin Research Center for Russian and East European Jewry and is currently chairman of the Russian and Slavic Studies Department. His current research and publications deal with transnational philanthropy and advocacy, non-state diplomacy, agrarian history, and migration. Uh, Jonathan, please. Thank you, Isabella. Um, you've asked me to uh, use my time today to think and drill down about the impact of these events on the Israeli landscape. And given that the hijacker's destination was Israel, it stands to reason that the hijacking and trial must have had powerful effects there. And some of our previous speakers alluded to that. Let's start, with the, anal let's start the analysis with the hijacker's peers living in Israel. From my conversations with many former refuseniks living in Israel, most are split regarding their moments of awakening. Some indeed say the Six Day War, while others say it was the hijacking. By contrast, an older generation insisted that there had always been a Zionist movement in the Soviet Union. For them, these youngsters of the 1960s and the 1970s got outsized credit for creating a movement that had in fact existed since the late 19th century. So let's accept as a given the difficulty of coming to a consensus among former refuseniks. There's a greater obstacle, however, to scholarly understandings about Israel's responses to the Leningrad episode or pretty much anything else connected to the Soviet Jewry movement. The continued inaccessibility to the archive of the semi-secret agency, which is called either Nativ or Nishkat Keshel, that Glenn referred to, that was responsible and still is for all things connected to Soviet Jewry. So, how did Jerusalem and Moscow arrive at the dramatic scenes in Leningrad? From 1948 until 1968, Israeli leaders actually did not openly encourage emigration of Soviet Jews, which may be surprising to some. During these two decades, relations between the countries had ups and downs amid the tides of the Cold War. Bilateral relations deteriorated quickly following Israel's victory over Soviet client armies in the June 1967 war. Moscow, Moscow, as Tzvi mentioned, severed diplomatic ties and within months launched a venomous anti-Zionist campaign throughout the Eastern Bloc. Then, in November 1969, months before the hijacking, Prime Minister Golda Meir announced from the Knesset podium that the Kremlin should permit emigration to Israel for any Soviet Jew who decided to do so. Clearly, therefore, Israel's public break from the entirely quiet understanding with the Kremlin predated the hijacking. It seems to me that Golda and other leaders sincerely cared about the fate of refuseniks, and all Soviet Jews for that matter. That being said, it also seems to me that she, much like the so-called establishment lead Jewish leaders in America and Britain, preferred a behind-the-scenes approach to the Soviet Jewry issue. The example from Anat's film about Golda's intervention with Franco to commute the death sentences of Kuznetsov and Dimshitz illustrates Mayer's preferred way of operating. Reflecting on the hijacking as a pivotal moment points to a wider analytical lens. Based on my research on the global movement, the episode accelerated the widespread entry of women into organized advocacy in the Jewish world. The best example were the British 35s, who adopted Anat's mother, Silva Zalmanson, as their cause célèbre. Judging from the results in Israel, this gendered aspect to the global campaign had less impact there in Israel. Why is that? At this time, Israel was still a relatively conservative society in which the women's equality movement hadn't yet really taken hold. Within Israel, as Anat's film suggests, the trials brought a significant uptick in popular mobilization in late 1970. Protests during the trials evidently were the biggest public demonstrations to date 
the largest drawing an estimated crowd of 30,000 in Tel Aviv. Thousands more at the time went to the Western Wall to voice their support for hunger strikes undertaken by former prisoners of Zion, those same releasees that early releasees that Steve referred to. Why did images of the hijackers appeal so powerfully to non-Russian Israelis, those same thousands that were going to these demonstrations? I believe that reports of the hijackers' bravery at trial suggested to Israelis that they fit Zionist archetypes of Jews taking action against enemies. This kind of nationalist call to arms was never more prominent in Israel than at this moment, still in the afterglow of the Six-Day War, contrasted painfully by the ongoing bleak war of attrition against Egypt and Syria. In this sense, the hijackers seem more Israeli than diasporic. All this being said, the mass popularity of the Soviet Jewry movement did not last long in Israel after the trial. If polling at the time can be trusted, a majority of Israelis didn't think more aggressive actions were needed by Jerusalem on behalf of Soviet Jewry, despite the urgings of advocacy organizations in Israel. What factors deterred most non-Russian speaking Israelis from sustained engagement in the Soviet Jewry movement after the Leningrad trials? For one, more immediate crises overshadowed the fate of the refuseniks. For instance, the Yom Kippur War in 1973 and the domestic political upheavals in Israel that followed the Yom Kippur War immediately thereafter. Secondly, Israelis, unlike people like Glenn and Svi, couldn't travel to the Soviet Union to give direct support to refuseniks. This lack of access to Soviet Jews in situ probably took some of the wind out of the movement's sails in Israel. Thirdly, an absence of Soviet diplomatic presence since 19, the middle of 1967 made it difficult to get enthusiastic about protesting. After all, there were no actual buildings or Soviet people to yell at in Israel. Fourth, unlike diaspora Jews, who usually campaigned from a sense of moral responsibility and had no prior expectations for action from their home governments, most Israelis probably assumed that their own home government in Jerusalem was the body responsible for the fate of Soviet Jews. Added to these immediate factors, I suspect that some added dynamics contribute to ambivalence about the Soviet Jewry issue in the Israeli body politic and leadership. For starters, the Israeli left had been aligned with the socialist world, with Moscow at its center, at least until Stalin's death. Even after Khrushchev's damning secret speech in 1956, many in the ranks of the elite left in Israel still had ties to global socialist networks, alongside a growing recognition of Soviet sins. On the negative side of the coin, after 1967, absolutely no doubt remained that Moscow served as the political patron and arsenal for Israel's hostile neighbors. Yet despite that undeniable fact, some Israelis remained ambivalent towards the Soviet Union because they didn't want their country, Israel, to be identified mostly as an American pawn or proxy in the ongoing Cold War. Lastly, although I have no smoking gun, it seems to me that the act of hijacking itself however we'd like to talk about it, must have been challenging for at least some Israelis in the 1970s, given the rash of Palestinian hijackings against Israeli and other targets. Many former Israeli activists and historians believe that the Leningrad trials brought diaspora Jews closer to the aggressive tactics promoted by Nativ or Ishkata Kesha. These included public vocal action against Soviet representatives in the West. According to this line of thought, this gravitation toward ardent activism then gave Israel even greater influence on diaspora advocacy organizations like the National Council for Soviet Jewry or maybe even the student struggle that Glenn was a part was, that Glenn was a leader of. I don't see that the documents bear this out, however. And no matter how hard any organization or elected official pushed, vacillation between crises and detente always guided Washington's policies towards Moscow much more than human rights considerations. Looked at soberly in retrospect, the Israeli government never energetically educated the public about the Soviet Jewry movement, even during the Leningrad trials. And as a side note, it still doesn't. Why? It seems to me that the reason derived mostly from, direct, from domestic realities. Until Natan Sharansky entered politics in the late 1980s, no Israeli politician prioritized Soviet Jewry. Until then, successive governments had to be nudged toward visible action by voluntary associations led mostly by Russian speakers and student groups. Judged from a distance of several decades, from the point of view of Israeli officials, attaining the main goal of greater immigration would be best served through quiet channels and less by outwardly confronting the Kremlin. 
This pro approach predated and outlasted the Leningrad hijacking and trials. What else didn't change as a result of these events? Jerusalem and the advocacy organizations in Israel always believed that Soviet Jews should emigrate to the Jewish state, not elsewhere. After all, hadn't the hijackers, as well as refuseniks who came before and after them, taken great risks precisely for this? Amongst most Israelis, whatever their degree of engagement with the campaign, the events in Leningrad confirmed the role of Zionism in the awakening of Soviet Jews. Israeli leaders and the general public had much less bandwidth to listen to other voices calling for freedom of movement or religious liberties inside the Soviet Union. And they were there and at least to some degree no less prominent than the voices to be let free entirely, uh, to emigrate. This tension between the singular national movement that Israelis wanted, personified by the Leningrad hijackers, versus the layered realities of Soviet Jewry emerged with force in the, in the mid 1970s. Time doesn't permit a fuller description of what became known as the dropout crisis. The short version goes something like this. Having arrived in Rome or in Vienna en route to Tel Aviv in the mid 1970s, tens of thousands of Soviet Jews allowed exit visas to Israel, now demanded the right to migrate to the West. This embarrassing scenario sparked acute conflict between Jerusalem and the American Jewish service organizations who handled the transit of Soviet Jews. The former, meaning the Israelis, demanded that all of the immigrants continue to be sent to Israel. The latter, the American Jewish organizations, by and large supported other visions of justice for these refugees from oppression. Coming full circle from 1970 back to today and in summation, and with quite a bit of discomfort, it seems to me that the seeds of the current rift between Israel's leadership and many communities in the diaspora were planted unwittingly by the heroic, naive protagonists of the Leningrad hijacking. Admittedly, a lot of what I've offered here is educated conjecture, but I hope my reflections here capture the essence and the outcomes of the Israeli responses to these dramatic developments in 1970. Thank Hi, you Isabella. Much. I'm sorry, I have to say something. First of all, when you use the word hijacking, you have to be careful. You may think that all people know, but when you use the word hijacking, people immediately imagine that you take a plane with full of people and you hijack people. Those are not hijackers. People who buy all the tickets to the plane and take an empty plane are not hijacking, and you cannot, you can definitely compare it with Palestinian hijackers who took people and threatened civilians. There is a huge difference between taking a plane, an empty plane, and taking people, and this you should know. And the second thing is regarding the Israeli government, is that the Israeli government were the one who created the 35s. The difference between the Israeli government and the American government is that everything the Israeli government did was a secret, because they were afraid of world uh, reviews. And the American government were able to show off with their results. For example, my mother was released after four years thanks to a, a secret prisoner exchange with the Israeli government. They caught a Soviet spy. They exchanged her, uh, him with my mother. She herself didn't know about it. She only knew about it 15 years after. But when the Americans did an amazing thing and they exchanged uh, eight prisoners, including my father and the pilot, for two Soviet spies who were caught in New Jersey, all of the news they were telling about it. So you cannot, uh, it's just simply not true. The Israelis were always, the, first of all, uh, the Israelis were the first to do something for Soviet Jewry. Native organization was the first to create, it was created in 1951. And though you may think sometimes they made mistakes, you know, we all made mistakes in respect, in uh, looking back, but the Israeli government did a lot behind the scenes and that's it. And I'm sorry for barging in, but I, I just felt like it was a terrible misleading. Well, I actually, and I'm going to come back to Jonathan and ask if he has a response to what uh, you just said, but I wanted to ask you, uh, in fact, a related question. And before I do, I actually want to remind our viewers that, um, those, uh, that you can send your questions via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter, at Canon Institute or on our Facebook page. And please include your name and affiliation when you are sending the questions. So Anat, I actually wanted to ask you um, to, uh, to uh, explain, in fact, why is there this, this question of, do we call them hijackers? Do we not call them hijackers? And one of the really interesting things that um, 
that is discussed in the film and that we, we know from books is how much the, uh, the group, uh, how much effort the group put into making sure that no one was harmed and making sure that, uh, yeah, that in fact, uh, people, who, uh, people who would have been taken off the plane, right, the original pilot uh, and the crew would have been comfortable. So I don't know if you can mention maybe uh, some things about that. So, well, the, the, the main motto of the film and the story and the group was that the ideal is not an excuse. There is a good ideal, there is a good cause, but it's not an excuse to hurt anyone. And the only people that might have been slightly hurt, but they wouldn't have been, are the pilots that would have been removed from the plane before takeoff. But they also uh, bought them sleeping bags, a tent, uh, some vodka, and a tetanus shot. And um, the pilots themselves, in the trial, when they had to uh, testify, they said that uh, they don't see how they would have been harmed in any, in any way. But in any case, the group said no blood shed. That was not the point. Uh, they only risked themselves. They took themselves as victim, not others. And this is very important. This is the difference between terrorist and not terrorist. That's the difference. Well, and you're not a terrorist. And in fact, in Russia, I believe your parents are still considered and all participants of the group are still considered terrorists. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Uh, a film that was made in 2009 called the, the, throughout the whole film uh, Terrorist. And um, uh, four years ago, when my film was released, a TV channel in Russia, they did a, a broadcast 30 minutes showing my film, which was, by the way, illegal because they didn't get my permission. But never mind, we may use it against them at some point. And the, the whole program, they said that my film is a lie. And the truth is that the group, they all said, we wish we want to go home. We want to go home. This is how they distort things, because the group said, we just wanted to go home, meaning Israel. And the Russians said, we wanted to go home, like they're crying, they wanted to go to, you know, to the apartment. So this is one example. Actually, um, in a few days on Sunday, there will be a story about this on the, inter also they interview my mother in the TV uh, channel um, Mir TV in Russia. And I'm curious to see, I'm very curious, I'm waiting to see, I will keep you posted. See how they, uh, that would be very interesting. And mm -hmm. the last thing I want to say is while Jonathan was speaking about the 35s, you were pointing out to something you're wearing around your neck. Can you yes. say what it is? Uh, I'll try to keep closer and not just my mouth. Okay. Here you go, if you can see. <laughs> what is it? Tell Those us. are necklaces of my mother and father. This was the, an idea of a group called the 35 Women Campaign for Soviet Jewry which I love because they were so original with how they did uh, protesting. So one example was that they had a Jew, uh, Jewry person created uh, necklaces with the names of prisoner of Zion saying, let my people go and the name of the prisoner of Zion. And the first one who wore it was Ingrid Bergman, the actress Ingrid Bergman. She was wearing my mother's medallion. And this takes a lot of attention. You know, I was speaking at the Knesset today and uh, I came with this and uh, immediately the makeup she asked me what is this and then I could tell her about this so this brings a discussion it's very visual it's interesting and um, and I wore this for you guys you know so it's a this silver is, Amazon and a door Isabella yes okay this is Glenn I uh, just uh, want to amplify a little bit about what I not said last year I had the uh, the privilege of going back to Moscow um, and visited this incredible Jewish museum in Moscow, which is put up by Chabad, which is the, I guess, the recognized legal Jewish entity, but it's an incredible Jewish museum. And actually part of it uh, is about the Soviet Jewry movement and those Soviet Jews and the Soviet Jewish effort within the Soviet Union for emigration. The part that's left out, and again, I emphasize this because they even had two of our protest posters and uh, photos of uh, refuseniks and uh, all sorts of other things. But the part that was left out was anything about the 1970 attempt to take the plane. That is absolutely verboten. Now, Yosef Mendelevich, who was one of the participants, was indeed interviewed by the museum. But his, the video of his interview was deep sixed. If you know about it and you ask about it, they might be able to pull it off a shelf and let you see it. 
but it's not there as part of the exhibit. Very interesting. And Glenn, since you are now um, speaking, why don't I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned it briefly, and I know it from your bio or watching some previous interviews with you, that you um, were actually a veteran of the civil rights movements in the U.S. And the, uh, that the Jewish movement, the struggle for Soviet Jewry, borrowed quite a lot from that movement. Is that correct? Can you say more about that? Yeah, the uh, a group of us who were involved as students in the Soviet Jewry movement, and in fact, Yaakov Birnbaum, who was older, but also involved, uh, felt that if we were working for the rights of blacks in America, we should work for the rights of Jews in the Soviet Union. Now, remember that at that time, until 67, we weren't even thinking about emigration. Yes, we had up on our first demonstration uh, in 64, a sign that said, let my people go, but we were echoing the biblical phrase. We weren't even thinking seriously about emigration. Uh, but the model, uh, the model for getting things done uh, was the civil rights movement. Uh, Martin Luther King's philosophy, which of course borrowed from Gandhi, was, uh, was very influential on us. Now the civil rights movement took a sharper turn, uh, starting maybe in 65, 66, and I was involved in the student then Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, uh, when it became more violent and its chair, H. Brad Brown, said violence is American as cherry pie, I bailed out. Uh, so yes, we borrowed that, but again, we gave it unique Jewish twists and uh, Jewish symbols. Uh, and we must say that the, the leaders of our group were young rabbis, young charismatic rabbis. And that I think that made a difference. It gave really a Yiddish atam, a, a Jewish flavor to the movement. We had a sense of history. We had a sense they were actually working for the redemption of our people. Thank you very much. And so I want to circle to Jonathan now uh, to let him give a response to what Anat said. But before I do, I want to remind you that you can send your questions via email to canon at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Canon Institute or on our Facebook page. And once again, please include your name and affiliation. Uh, Jonathan, what, uh, I don't know if you would like to respond to Anat's comments. Um, and if not, then I have a question of my own that I'd like to ask you. Um, sure, uh, briefly. Um, I don't believe that I attached a value judgment to the word hijacking. Um, simply, I am observing it as, as it was used at the time and in subsequent decades, that's just a fact. Uh, the value judgments, anyone can tack on it what they want. Uh, also in terms of what the Israeli government did or didn't do, I, um, th my remarks were meant to present both what the Israeli government was doing, but also what kind of effect uh, the Leningrad events had on the Israeli public. And there is a vast gap between, yes, what the government was doing behind the scenes, because that's the way they wanted to work, <clears throat> for better or worse. And many things were done um, versus um, the kind of public education uh, that was done around this by the government, the Ministry of Education or, anyone, or anywhere else. And it's a very different story. And I think we need to keep that in mind. You know, two things can be true at once. And um, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Okay, thank you. So let me actually now go to Tzvi and then I'll come back to you with the other question that I had. So Tzvi, I'm wondering if you can maybe uh, put in sharper focus for us, um, what was the, the role of the movement for Soviet Jewry within, um, within the broader context of the Cold War, I would say, within the uh, you know, American policy, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Soviet Union, uh, was, it, was it an important part of that? Was it a sideshow? Was it on the margins? How would you characterize that? That movement emerged to many people's surprise as a major issue between East and West, between the Soviet Union and its client states and the United States, West Europe. It did so for the reasons I mentioned. It had a very broad appeal across the political spectrum. And in some ways, perhaps it was embodied in the person of Senator Henry Jackson of Washington State, 
Senator Jackson was a member of the Democratic Party. He was rather conservative on foreign policy issues and rather liberal on domestic issues. And Jackson and Charles Vanek in the House of Representatives, neither of whom was Jewish, found the Soviet jury cause sufficiently appealing that they sponsored this well-known provision in the middle 1970s that denied most favored nation status to any state which did not allow free emigration. The Soviets were rather surprised that the question of Jews, whom they regarded as marginal, would play a role in the East-West relationship. And we actually now have the transcript of some Politburo conversations where Brezhnev, then the Secretary General of the Communist Party, figuratively scratches his head and says, what's going on here? And he turns to Andropov, later his successor, who was the head of the KGB and, and seeks an explanation. Why do people care about this? Why is this such a big deal? And the Americans are telling us that we have to do this and that. Otherwise, our general relationship will deteriorate. So the issue loomed very, very large in the Soviet Western relationship. Unlike, I would say, the issue of Jews in Nazi Germany had in the 1930s. And uh, perhaps the 1930s and the relative inaction by Western governments influenced their readiness to act in the 1970s and 1980s. Thank you, Tzvi. And I think that we have a question from the audience from uh, David Stahl, which I think I'm going to guess relates to what you were just saying. The question is to Glenn. Uh, Glenn, you stated in your remarks that in some way, in addition to the positive effect the Soviet Jewry movement played on the lives of Jews in the USSR, that the movement also brought redemption to the American Jewish community. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? For students, it was a little bit different, I think, from our parents. Uh, I remember asking my parents, what did you do at the time of the Holocaust? And they said, well, when we, we didn't know, and when we knew, we felt as an American Jewish community, we felt powerless. I think on the student side, it was a little different. This was the civil rights movement, the beginning of the anti-war movement. Uh, we didn't have the, uh, the hang-ups. Um, uh, you know, for, for those who had parents who were Holocaust survivors, I think it was a more delicate situation. Some parents didn't speak about it. Some parents did speak or implied that this is what the, the students should do. And you, we really felt something extra in the air. Uh, we felt when we were going out, it wasn't just to exercise our lungs. It wasn't just, uh, we felt we actually had a connection to those either who we knew or those who we didn't know. But we really felt after a while that we were moving the levers of history. And if we didn't move the levers, at least we were pushing against the levers. So this was an extraordinarily, uh, if you want to say it, it was a movement that moved from the, uh, that toggled, I guess, or maybe included both the physical and the spiritual. Thank you very much. Um, and Jonathan, we have a question for you from the audience. And I'm just going to repeat that uh, if you are in the audience and you want to send us your questions, you can send them via email to Canon at Wilson Center dot Canon at Wilson Center dot org via Twitter at Canon Institute or on our Facebook page. So the question for Jonathan is from uh, Shaul Kellner, Associate Professor of Sociology and Jewish Studies at Vanderbilt University. Uh, and the question is, what was the rationale for demonstrations in Israel? In the US, the rationale was clear, pressure the US government to take up the Soviet Jewish cause. But in Israel, Israel was acting through Nativ. So what was the goal of the public demonstrations in Israel? Uh, 
um, you know, honestly, I haven't studied that particular, you know, that particular question in depth. But uh, from the familiarity that I do have for it, there was no illusion that by protesting um, in the streets of Tel Aviv or anywhere else, that that was going to move the Soviet government in any particular direction. Um, and again, from the polling, it seems like even the, the Israeli body politic wasn't looking for the Israeli government to necessarily be more aggressive uh, with the Soviet Union. Rather, it seems to me that this was just an honest outpouring of uh, a kind of emotional solidarity. Um, and it was very specific to these heroic images that um, of the hijackers themselves and their uh, statements at trial. You know, it very much, th these trials backfired entirely on the Soviets, and we know that now, uh, and it also had an effect in, in the United States. What, there, there was no, and uh, you're right, uh, Shaol is right in the question that yes, there's a qualitative difference in terms of what the crowd was attempting to accomplish. Uh, this was, in fact, uh, the people who went out into the streets. There are voluntary, there are a number of voluntary uh, advocacy organizations, but um, beyond those, you know, few, the few activists themselves, this was just people's emotional response and to what they were seeing. Uh, sorry to write in, I want to agree with Jonathan and, and just add something to that. Um, the demonstrations were not organized by the, the Israeli government. The was really by the people and basically uh, started with my mother's uncle who was in Israel and he did a hunger strike at the Wailing Wall and people joined him, other prisoners at the time who were recently released. And this was just, and then it just became a cause that was uh, just a lot of people got swept away into that cause. And it's, it's the, it's, it was the, the, this whole human rights movement was coming from the people. The hijacking of the empty plane is from the people and the movement was from the people, and that affected the politicians to do something. Isabella? Yes. Okay, this is Glenn. Uh, just a little bit of a background. Again, I couldn't hear everything Jonathan said, but remember that the Israeli government, the Lishka, as Jonathan said, began in 1951. The people who ran the Lishka, the people who ran Israel's uh, liaison bureau, Soviet jury office, were themselves veterans of Aliyah Bet, the illegal immigration to Israel at the time of World War II and uh, the British occupation of Palestine until 1948. These people then became the basis of the Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service. These were very battle-hardened individuals. They did not work the way you and I work in a public method. I'll give you one small story. In 1970, uh, that same summer, as I've been talking about, my wife and I visited uh, a guy named, uh, uh, well, okay, uh, the, the person who was then the, the head of the Soviet jury office. Uh, he was from Latvia. He was working in Ali Abed. He had been working for the, American, for the Israeli embassy in, in uh, Moscow, had been thrown out from the Soviet Union for meeting Jews. His name, okay, I'll tell you the name. His name was Nehemia Levanon. Nehemia looked at us, my wife and I, uh, and he said, who tells you what to do? And like a bunch of stupid Americans, we said to him, well, we do what we think is right. Nehemiah was scandalized. He said, your problem is you don't take orders. Because to him, the people who ran that office, this was life and death. This was really the way you worked. If you didn't just do what you wanted to do, you did what you were told by people who you assumed knew better than you. Now, things flipped. Things really began to flip. Uh, actually, in, uh, we mentioned in 1969, when a group of Jews from Soviet Georgia issued uh, increasingly dramatic and, uh, and uh, uh, appeals from the Soviet Union to the extent that Golda Meir finally read one of their appeals from the, from the Knesset. The Israeli government then formed the Israel Public Council for Soviet Jews, and that was working, and what you have to uh, uh, name one person who was extremely active, still active today, Enid Wortman in Jerusalem. But this went far beyond something directed, as, as, uh, as Anat said, far beyond, far beyond. This was Jew, this was Israelis thinking about their brethren trapped in the Soviet Union. And this became a really, truly emotional issue. So in a sense, this got away from the Israeli government, uh, but that was good. That was good because it really expressed deep-seated emotion and, and connections. Thank you for that, Glenn. And we have a comment from Bill Hill. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be so much of a question, but a comment. Uh, but I think maybe I will ask, 
Zvi to respond to it and then whoever else uh, wants to jump in. So Bill Hill says, of course, U.S. relations with the USSR had geopolitical motivations, but I would argue against denigrating the role of human rights in the formulation and implementation of U.S. policy. In my observation, many of my colleagues and leaders were sincerely moved and motivated by the plight of Soviet Jews. We worked closely with human rights NGOs and advocates in the West and fought hard to keep human rights issues as an important, if not the only part of the US-Soviet agenda. I would argue that it was the Soviets who used this issue cynically, turning immigration on and off cynically, depending on the state of other aspects of the relationship. So I don't know, Tzvi, if you, uh, if you have anything to say in response to that or anybody else. I fully agree with that. Human rights aspect, as I said, appealed to a wide variety of people, including those, and as Glenn pointed out, who had been involved in other human rights issues, such as African-American civil rights. And certainly the Soviets used this very cynically. I used to think of this as a faucet. When the Soviet Union was pleased with what was going on in the relationship with the West, the faucet would be turned on and large numbers, relatively large numbers of Soviet Jews would leave. So you get 1,000. And then in December of 1959, that same, uh, 1979, that same year, the faucet is turned off because of the invasion of Afghanistan and the reaction of of the, the United States. For the Soviets, human rights was a non-issue. It was all about realpolitik. Thankfully, that was not the case in the West. Thank you for that. And Anat, we have a question for you from Peretz Rodman, who is asking if you have been surprised by any of the responses to your film over the four years since you've been screening it. Um. I actually, I think most of the responses were very good. Uh, it's a subject, it sounds political, but somehow everybody agrees with it. East and West, left and right, everybody agrees there should be freedom to leave a country, except from some Russians who sometimes write to me, your parents should have been killed, your parents are murderers. We know the truth because we saw a Russian film, which is absolutely ridiculous to trust a Russian documentary. Uh, I would quote my father and call it a fairy tale, a documentary fairy tale. The thing is about, I noticed, uh, I was surprised, but how easy it is to brainwash people. If you say, I could tell that people, the first thing that they saw about this subject, this is what they believe and it doesn't matter how much you can prove to them and show them and uh, other things, they remember the first thing that they saw. And this is something we should, really think about also today what i learned from uh, making this film is that if i don't have time to research something i simply don't believe it that's like the minimum i can do <laughs> or at least i don't know but uh, yeah this is something uh, a few people wrote to me and it, it's by it hurts my feelings uh, on the other hand i i feel very connected to everyone when i get good responses and luckily for me, seriously, 90, 95% of the responses are very positive. Um, maybe I have a captive, captive audience. I don't know. <laughs> but also my parents are so, so, so cute. So you cannot, how can you not like them? You know. Absolutely. Um, and having had the pleasure of meeting your mom, I absolutely agree with you. Um, Jonathan, I want to ask you about uh, the current moment in Israel and the kind of situation or role of uh, former Jewish, uh, the former emigrants from the Soviet states, and we're now into generation, I know in Israel they call it generation 1.5, generation 2.0, right, the, the young people who were born into those families. Periodically we hear things about, you know, discrimination, sort of a condescending approach, but on the other hand, there are also that, there is a sense that they have played an important role in, uh, in the Israeli kind of the boom of the economic boom of the last, um, last decade or so. So uh, can you um, say a few words about that? 
Well, I can try. Um, you know, I think uh, the answer to the question can is situated sort of within the general Israeli schizophrenia, really, uh, about who we are and how we got here. And so, you know, on, on the one hand, there's, you know, uh, um, both pride, but also confusion amongst this younger generation that's grown up, either born or grown up in Israel, uh, after arriving at a very young age. Uh, Anat is one, is one representative of a much wider phenomenon. And, you know, I think like any children of immigrants uh, anywhere, uh, struggle with, uh, are challenged by issues of identity and what that means, because as powerful as um, Russian speaking cultural identity might be, um, Israeliism, whatever that is, is quite a powerful steamroller as well. And, you know, to a degree, okay. they are caught in the middle of this. And, uh, you know, time will tell. In terms of the politics of the country, um, there was a moment, but the moment is past, where um, that group of immigrants from the Soviet Union most of whom arrived from the very late, late 1980s into the mid to late 1990s were a significant constituency and could be in a way considered kingmakers in terms of the general Israeli uh, political electoral system. Um, that moment has passed. And I think um, it, it will not come back because it's a generational thing. Because although the parents and grandparents generation uh, still, for the most part, stubbornly vote, it appears, for what is left of a kind of that single issue party, which is uh, Lieberman's party, uh, their children um, in, in their voting patterns are much, much wider and you know, pretty much cross through the spectrum or most of the spectrum in Israeli electoral politics. So we're, you know, it, it's a new day. And also in terms of foreign policy, you know, there we've had ups and downs in terms of um, how Israel, and I'm speaking of the last 20 years and not, not the 1970s, um, how Israel wants to position itself in uh, this unipolar or multipolar world vis-a-vis -vis Moscow and Putin. And I think here also, there was a moment in time, especially when Lieberman had positions of power within the government, where there was more uh, of a priority place on really cultivating those, rela those relations, his decline as a political figure, but also some hard lessons that were learned about what Russia's priorities are in our region and in general ha have changed the tone. And, and so uh, whatever that moment was also in terms of the formulation of foreign policy, that, that moment has also passed. Thank you very much for that. And I have the last question uh, that we're, uh, that I'm going to pose. Uh, the question actually comes from uh, Cheryl Jacobs Lewin, uh, Chicago co-chair of Americans for Safe Israel. The question is for Anat. What are school children in grammar and high school in Israel taught about Anat's parents and their friends who were arrested? I actually want to broaden it and ask it directed to everyone uh, so that in, in the concluding minutes of our, pod, uh, of our webcast, you can maybe address it because I know that all of you in one way or another are involved in the kind of the preservation of the memory of that movement, which actually has faded for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so what, what, uh, what are you doing perhaps in order to make the memory of these clearly significant events really part of the collective memory, I think not just of the Jewish community, uh, but also more broadly to the extent that it influenced uh, significant events during the Cold War. So why don't we go in the order in which you spoke? So Anat, Glenn, then Svi, and Jonathan. Anat, why don't we start with you? Um, I actually created a curriculum, an educational curriculum, um, 33 plans, uh, lesson plans for educators about Soviet Jewry, interactive, interesting, not just like learn the dates and the names. No, I, we made it very interesting for teenagers and, and twins and people for people to, I want them to be carried away by the stories uh, through um, uh, slideshow, through art, through music, through um, many other things and it's called the Refusenik project it's very easy to find you type on Google the Refusenik project or you go refusenikproject.org 
you can have it's all free over there you have the history timeline and everything we are now working on it to translate to hebrew and later into russian i have uh, joined with uh, partners uh, in, in america a non-profit organization jewish learning works which are collecting donation for towards this cause for translation and towards also promoting this for example recently just recently two weeks ago we did a giveaway drawing for educators who thought about Soviet Jewry. So we gave uh, awards of $1,000, $700, and $300. And this is encouraging more people to teach about it because everybody can agree it's interesting. But to make this such, such a big switch, they used to already teach something. And to teach something new, you have to encourage them in some way. And I hope, I, I not, now in Israel, there are 1,500 high schools. Out of them, in 1,800, uh, 1800 high schools, the religious ones, they're teaching about the Soviet Jewry just a little bit for 10 graders, but it's not enough. And it should be part of the national memory. Everybody should know about it. Uh, at least the minimum they should know about that the Soviet Jewry people were not allowed to live and, they were, and what the prisoner time means. That's like the minimum that I'm trying to do. And I need everybody's help and you can contact me. I'm very easy to find. I'm the only one in the world with this name. I'm not Zalman Zong So I'm very easy to track down. This is also for easy for the KGB and also for you. Find me. Thank you very much, Glenn. And, and I'm, my team is signaling me that we have to be wrapping right. up. So just so I'm gonna, take so I'm a, gonna, a minute. I'm gonna, be very, I'm gonna be very swift. Number one, uh, ditto many times to what Anad is doing. She's doing a terrific job. Number two, it's very important to have an archive of the Soviet Jury Movement, something I've been working on now for over a decade, because you need documentation. You need to remember uh, when people go back years from now, what did we do? How did we do it? What did we think? We need to have that material available. So, uh, do all. Thank you. Svi. Historical memories in the West go back to the day before yesterday. It requires what some of my colleagues call mnemonic entrepreneurs, people who want to revive, disseminate, promote history for something to be remembered. That has been successfully done to a great degree regarding the Holocaust. It has not been done regarding the Soviet Jews. Jerry Goodman, who is the head of the National Conference on Soviet Jewry, has also launched an educational campaign it succeeds. And I would just remind people of George Santayana's remark that those who do not remember their history are condemned to relive it. Thank you, Tzvi. And Jonathan? Well, it seems to me like uh, many other historical subjects, it's, it's an uphill struggle to try to implant uh, this history uh, in younger generations. I think there are a lot of efforts. The time is, uh, time is over, so we really can't talk about them. There are a number of current efforts to try to do something around this. I think it, it behooves us uh, all around this issue, whether one is Jewish or not, because it is one of those moments in time um, where there is a global consensus uh, on behalf of what is essentially a human rights issue. And, and that good work was done. So it behooves all of us to, uh, uh, to elevate this particular moment in history. And I, for one, hope that that will happen. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And thank you, everybody. Thank you to our listeners I, and, and, and those who are viewing us online. I'm very sorry that we couldn't ask all of your questions. Uh, we're running out of time. I want to remind everybody that if you want to view Operation Wedding, you can do it at operation-wedding-documentary.com. -docu uh, and, uh, and thank you and to be continued. <laughs>